My stepmother is a complete nightmare. My father decides to send me to boarding school. And when I return, I discover he is married to the genuine villain. So get this, guys. It's not all love between her and my father. She decides to stab him in the back by having him sign the house in her name for a tax write-off. Only to stab him later by stating, you know what? You are free to leave now because this is my house. I'm not going to let that happen. So I decided to try this. I was involved in a fatal car accident in June. My mother breathed her last breath. I lay in a puddle of her own blood. Nobody was able to save her because paramedics came too late on a quiet route. I was 10 when I lost her. It was difficult for me to survive without her and move on with life. My father had become preoccupied with his business and began to arrive home late. I was completely on my own. As an only child, I had few options for entertainment. I get afraid alone in the enormous house and couldn't feel the usual warmth of home. My grades began to deteriorate and I began to lose weight. When my health began to deteriorate, my father became concerned. My teacher called one day to inform him of my lack of interest in poor grades. And that evening, my father spoke with me for the first time in months. That night, he seemed fatigued, and what he said crushed my heart. That day, he disclosed his plan to send me to boarding school. I realized there was no point in pleading with him because dad had made up his mind. So barely a week later, I packed my bags and was sent to a boarding school far from my old home. Life wasn't easy there. I was bullied and mocked because of my quiet character, but I tolerated everything. My father did not visit me at all throughout those years which provided bullies with even more opportunities to disturb and harass me. I completed middle and high school with great grades, graduating with distinction and earning the opportunity to attend my preferred college. That was back in my hometown, by the way. My mother had always wanted me to study there, so I decided to go back. I was no longer a shy child. Instead, I was headstrong. However, when I encountered my father after many years, he had changed dramatically. He was not the haggard, miserable man I recalled from childhood, but rather a healthy-looking, lively man. To my astonishment, he embraced me with open arms and seemed pleased to see me again. My life made an 80-degree turn, and things finally began to improve for me. However, my happiness did not last long. I knew my dad was seeing someone based on his behavior, but I kept my lips shut. I did not ask him for anything. My college career ended, and I applied to a few universities. I had a couple months respite before my classes began. So I had plenty of time to decide what major to pursue, which university to attend, and so on. But something unexpected occurred throughout those several months. One day, I was sitting on the sofa watching TV when my father entered the home, hand in hand with a woman in her early 40s. I was stunned to see him so in love with her. And that's when I met my stepmother, Savannah, whom my father married in court. And just when I thought it was enough of a shock, I learned that the woman had two small children, two spoiled brats, an eight-year-old girl and a six-year-old boy, refused to listen to anyone in the family. I had no idea how I was going to live with him, especially when my father made it obvious that if I wanted to stay, I had to babies of her children. I tried to express my unwillingness, but he made it plain that there was no other choice. So ultimately, I had to agree. That's when all hell broke loose. Her children made it clear that they loathed me for whatever reason. I tried to bond with them for my personal benefit, but it didn't work. Dad and Savannah would leave them alone with me when they went on dates or trips, and her children would make sure to give me headaches. They made an effort to disrupt me by spoiling our grass, playing pranks on our neighbor's pets, and trashing my assignments. I ignored them for as long as I could until her eight-year-old kid destroyed my late mother's photographs, which I had stored in my bedside table drawer. That evening, when Dad arrived home, I told him everything. But Savannah interrupted and began yelling at me, accusing me of framing her children. I despised their being in the house. I waited for my father to support me, but that never happened. He merely repeated what he said and chastised me for making a fuss and claiming it was a mistake. I remained trapped in my room for days. It was incredibly terrible for me to have my mother's pictures taken away from me, but my father insisted that they were innocent and childish and that I shouldn't complain. I was disappointed, but I decided to let it go for a while. And just as I believed things would improve, I was proven incorrect again. After the incident, Savannah refused to acknowledge my presence, disregarded me like a plague, and kept me away. I purposefully made myself feel like an outsider in my own home. I didn't care much about it, but my fury boiled when I was assigned the job of picking them up from school and being forced to look after them despite my repeated denials. I had also lost my plate 
but dad was unconcerned. I attempted to get her boys to behave civilly, but they ignored me and my comments. A few days later, the youngsters got into trouble again. It was when I gathered all of my credentials and organized them into a file to present to my institution. I was working downstairs, preparing food for myself and them, when I noticed that none of them were making any noise or were in my sight. I abandoned the kitchen and went upstairs instead. It was then that I witnessed the horrible image in front of me. Everything I had written on the file had been torn and ripped into bits. Not a single piece of paper had been left intact, and my blood boiled as I watched them standing casually without a trace of shame. I leaped forward and slapped both of them across the face as I began to lecture them. The voices from downstairs suggested that my father and Savannah had arrived. This offered the two youngsters an opportunity to start shouting and wailing while playing the victim. They both hurried from the room, and when I followed them outside, I saw them hugging their mother and crying their eyes out. Dad's face paled as the two boys continued to deliver their sob story, which was entirely about me harming them. I crossed my arms and glared at them, indifferent, as Savannah turned scarlet with each passing instant. And the next thing I knew, she was moving towards me, raising her hand to smack me. I grabbed her hand before she could do so, glaring at her with hatred. The one began screaming and yelling at my face, and she tried to hit me, but I wouldn't let her. She immediately marched up to my father and yelled at him, begging him to put me out, and then I simply gazed at her dumbfounded. Was she requesting that my father kick his only son out of his own home? A loud smack that sent my head spinning sideways interrupted my thoughts, and for the first time in my entire life, my father raised his hand to me. I started telling him what had happened, but my father seemed unconcerned. I went to my room like my dad wanted me to, but I was quite frustrated. Sitting in my room, I texted a friend to help me print all of the paperwork again. While doing so, my room door sprang open and my father entered. I expected an apology, but all I got was my father instructing me to go apologize. I couldn't help but laugh amusingly. I knew exactly what to do, so I did it. I'd already figured out my role in the house and realized that remaining here any longer wouldn't assist me. So the next day I packed my bags and left the house to find another place to stay. After that, I was alone, had to deal with everything on my own. It was difficult to obtain accommodations on such short notice. I had nowhere to go, but I'd saved some money and happily had not quit my part-time work. I had to go. I spoke with numerous agencies to find an appropriate location and after wasting an entire day on the street, I discovered a tiny, pleasant apartment near my institution. It was not the ideal place to live, but it was by far the best option. So I quickly paid the advance and demanded that the landlord allow me to move in the same day, and the landlord agreed. This is how I found my first apartment. After that, a few months went by without Dad contacting me at all. It ached, but I remained tough and concentrated on myself. He clearly wanted a nice relationship with his new family which is why he cut me off. He was prepared to do so. My classes began a few weeks later and I devoted my full focus to my study. However, living alone was not easy. I mean, I had to get new work too. With only one employee, all expenses became unmanageable. I had to work overtime and attend school in the morning, which was a rigorous schedule, but I had no alternative. I felt depleted. And because I had no touch with anyone, I became depressed. So I called my father once, but I wish I hadn't. When dad heard my voice, instead of asking where I was, he began shouting about his own fantastic life and how my leaving made it so simple for him. Dad, I had no idea how to answer, so I discreetly ended the line and never called him back. And it's not surprising that he didn't care. I realized I needed to go on and accept that he didn't want anything to do with me. I began going out with my classmates and simply hanging out with them, which is how I've met new people and developed a few excellent friends. My coworkers were friendly and encouraging, so I soon bonded with them. My grades were also good, so my life was finally starting to move in the correct direction. I quickly learned to stand on my own two feet. I learned how to deal with my own issues, and within a few months, I went from a depressed child to a confident adult. I no longer craved anyone's attention or love, but instead began focusing on my own life and profession. That's when I met a girl and started dating her. Life was going well, and I had finally found serenity. And that is how three years passed. I was no longer a freshman. By my third year as a senior, I had relocated to a more comfortable apartment, gotten a paid internship at a very good company, and made a lot of money. So I stopped working part-time at a restaurant and obtained a fantastic job in an office. Though the salary wasn't spectacular, 
It was far better than my previous employment, and I saw it as an opportunity to gain work experience and learn a new skill. I was still in a relationship with the girl and very much in love with her at this point. My entire life was organized, and there were no major concerns until one day. I awoke to the continuous ringing of my doorbell and tried yelling at the guy to stop ringing it, but it was ineffective. I opened the door furious, but was held in place when I saw my father standing in front of me, disheveled and frightened. I was stunned and speechless when I saw him standing on my porch. I stared at him blankly, waiting for him to say something, anything, to break the silence that surrounded us. But he just looked down, as if ashamed to say anything. I took a deep breath and simply stepped aside to let him in. I had no idea what was going on, but his appearance made it clear that it was not good at all. He sat quietly on the sofa, and when I brought him water, he drank it as if he hadn't had it in hours. I sat across from him, anticipating his words. When he finally began to speak, I was stunned by his story. He revealed how Savannah had gradually manipulated him, and I couldn't help but feel a pang of bitterness knowing he had only just realized it. Despite my feelings, I listened as he explained how she had convinced him to transfer the house deed to her name under the guise of tax benefits. In his state of love and trust, he didn't question our motives. It was only later that he understood the magnitude of his mistake. Once Savannah had the papers, she no longer hid her contempt and began mistreating him, making his life unbearable. Tears streamed down his face as he recounted how she had turned on him immediately after achieving her goal, eventually kicking him out with nothing. I wasn't entirely surprised though. I had always sensed something amiss with her and her actions confirmed my suspicions. Dad, blinded by love, failed to see through her facade despite my warnings. I understood his pain, having once been in a similar position when he sided with Savannah over me. Now he was a victim of her deceit, left at the mercy of the daughter he had pushed away. Despite my lingering resentment, seeing him so vulnerable and distraught made me reconsider my initial reluctance to help. He was my father, the one who had supported me for so long. Seeing him in this state reminded me of my own past struggles, while he wasn't there for me emotionally, he did provide financial support and never left me empty-handed. Despite my initial shock and resentment, recalling my own past experiences, I decided to help him. I offered him a place to stay, which he accepted gratefully. However, he kept his head low, avoiding eye contact with me. I let him be like that for a few days, ensuring he had meals and even making breakfast for him before and after my university classes. I noticed he hadn't bought anything for himself, so I left him some money to use for whatever he needed, including clothes. I would occasionally find him crying in the lounge or in his room, his health deteriorating due to the medications he was taking. It was heartbreaking to see him in such a state. Despite my lingering resentment for him kicking me out selfishly, I pushed those feelings aside and focused on helping him. After all, he was all the family I had. I knew this wasn't the end. I had to find a way to reclaim our home and ensure that Savannah faced consequences for her actions. So I began meeting with lawyers and exploring legal avenues to bring her to justice. After days of searching, I found a suitable lawyer who was experienced and successful. I discussed the case with my dad, and although he was hesitant at first, he agreed to pursue legal action. Together, we met with the attorney to discuss the case. We learned that we needed more evidence against Savannah to strengthen our case. I asked my dad where he had met Savannah, hoping to uncover more information that could help us in our fight for justice. He explained that he had met Savannah at his previous job, so I went there with a friend who knew about my situation. Together, we found people who knew her, and that's how we met Zachary, who had experienced a similar situation with Savannah. We were shocked to learn that he couldn't take legal action due to a lack of evidence, so we decided to gather more. We devised a plan to trap Savannah. Zachary would contact her and threaten to expose her, leading to a meeting where we would record her confession of the crimes. When Savannah arrived, she became furious and laughed at Zachary, claiming he had no evidence to expose her. However, her statement was enough to incriminate her. With all the evidence gathered, we filed a case in court and awaited the hearing date. While we weren't certain of victory, we felt confident with our proof, knowing we were well prepared while she was not. Savannah was enraged to find herself in court, as her previous victims had never taken such action. Her eyes widened when she saw me sitting next to my father, realizing I was the one supporting him and helping him with the legal proceedings. During the trial, Savannah refused to admit her guilt. 
However, when we presented the evidence, her demeanor changed and she fell silent, realizing she had been caught. The court granted her time to provide her evidence, warning that the next hearing would be decisive. We presented Zachary and the other office colleagues as witnesses, all of whom supported our case against Savannah. Despite her efforts, she failed to provide any evidence to prove her innocence. To our surprise, more people came forward, revealing that Savannah had defrauded them as well. They joined our lawsuit against her, seeking justice and retribution. Even one of her victims, who had initially participated in our case, ultimately decided to pursue legal action independently. In the end, Savannah lost the case. While we were ecstatic about the outcome, Savannah could not accept defeat. In a fit of rage, she revealed her true intentions, admitting that she never loved my father and had planned to hurt him from the start, even before marrying him. This revelation devastated my father as he learned that Savannah had a history of preying on vulnerable men, marrying them, and defrauding them of their properties. Despite the pain she caused, we finally reclaimed our house. This serves as a cautionary tale and a reminder that karma eventually catches up to those who deceive and harm others. Savannah received the punishment she deserved, and I can only imagine the shock on her face when confronted by all her victims in court.